Good morning and welcome to FIRST. We invite you to worship along with us through song, prayer, giving, and opening God's Word. Are you new or visiting with us? Welcome. Stop by the connection desk in the foyer. We have a gift for you. If you have any questions about following Jesus, baptism, or becoming a member, you can speak to a counselor right next to the connection desk right after the service. We look forward to meeting. Now, here are some upcoming events happening at FIRST. We hope you'll join us for a very special evening of worship on Sunday, May 19th. In addition to our sanctuary choir, several other choirs and orchestras from around the state will be joining with us to premiere the brand new songbook, Like a River Glorious. This songbook is a collection of hymns arranged and orchestrated by Jay Rouse. And Jay will be our special guest that evening. This massive night of worship is going to be glorious. Join us on Sunday, May 19th, and let's worship together. We're closer to summer than ever before. This summer is going to be a blast with our incredible lineup of summer camps for kids. We have a variety of camps to choose from with sports and outdoor games, arts and music. These camps are designed to keep your kids active and engaged with their faith. See all our camps and register online at summeratfirst.com. Last weekend, our student ministry held an event off campus inviting students to enjoy a game of kickball. It was a fun but competitive environment with students playing against their small group leaders and doing their best to win bragging rights. Regardless of who won, it was a great game of kickball and a fun way to connect with students after the end of a season of midweek. First Student Ministry is continuing to seek creative ways to connect with their students and continue discipleship outside the classroom. Great job, First Student Ministry. We love to see the work of the kingdom. If you'd like to hear more details about everything I just mentioned and more, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter at fbccola.com. Now, let's worship together. Thank you so much. Everyone may be seated. And here is a testimony of his salvation as we worship through baptism. First, thank you again. We are happy to baptize one brother and one sister in Jesus' name. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, God. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank 我奉父子圣灵名为你施洗。Thank you first. I pray that Lord Jesus will pray, protect my brother sister in all their life and their family. 
bless first, bless America. Thank you. so much you may be seated. Well, the beautiful pulpit flowers today are given in honor of Brad and Lauren Smith's first wedding anniversary, and they're given by Lauren's parents, Ray and Janet Grigsby. And then Eileen Campbell will celebrate her 96th birthday on May the 2nd, and she's worshiping with us this morning by television. So we say happy birthday. Then if you visit with us this morning, we're so glad you're here. We want to connect with you, and there's a Connect card. You may fill it out in the bulletin. You may fill it out online or go by the Connection desk. But either way, we're so glad you're here, and we trust the Lord will bless everyone as we worship together. Let's take opportunity right now to stand and to greet those around us. May the 19th is going to be a massive night of worship and praise. We hope you'll come join us at 6 o'clock p.m. We'll have about 400 people in the choir, a huge orchestra, as we premiere 
the wonderful work like a river glorious. We hope you'll come and join us. That's May the 19th. As we recognize our graduates today in just a moment, we're going to be led in our offertory prayer by Clayton Stacy from the University of South Carolina, and then we'll hear testimonies from Luke McCrudden from Ben Lippin and Drew McKay from the University of South Carolina. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to come together this morning and worship you and celebrate these graduates. Thank you for being, us, being with us through the many late and difficult nights studying and for helping us all to persevere through these last few years. Lord, I pray that as each of us step out into this new chapter of our lives, whether it's starting college, going into grad school, or stepping out into the workforce, Lord, I pray that you would guide and protect us all. 
Help us to walk in your ways and live in a manner that is pleasing to you. I pray that despite all the distractions and busyness of life, that we would fix our eyes on you and seek to honor you as we step out into a new adventure and a new season of life. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Luke McCrudden, and I'm a senior at Bidlipin School. I've had the privilege of being a part of First Baptist for as long as I could remember. I'd like to thank all of the amazing leaders who have poured into me over the years, giving up their time, money, and effort to make me a better man and follower of Christ. First Baptist has brought me much joy through the years of children's ministry and student ministry. First Baptist has also brought me lifelong friends uh, that have helped me grow as a man in my faith. First Baptist even brought me my first job with the volunteers. I've learned so much up to this point from this church, and I will never forget the, the impact that the people here have made on my life. I hope that in college the Lord leads me to find something similar in a church of my own. So now, as I move forward into this next chapter of life, I'm reminded of the verse from Deuteronomy 31.8, which says this, But the Lord is the one who is marching before you. He is the one who will be with you. He won't let you down. He won't abandon you. So do not be afraid or scared. Lastly, thank you to everyone who has made this chapter of my life so good, and a special thank you to my parents and my family who have been with me every step of the way. Thank you. How's it going? My name is Drew McKay. Um, I'm a graduate from USC. So I've spent all four years of college plugged into First College Ministry. Um, it's really become my home. Um, I made most of my best friends here. Um, I met the most beautiful girl in the world here who I'm marrying in 13 days. Um, I think if there's one thing I learned during my time in college, it is how valuable simple discipleship is in our faith. Um, I grew up in church and always thought of discipleship as sort of having an intense Bible study or waking up at 3 a.m. to pray. Um, but I thought of it as something I sort of had to learn on my own. Um, but I remember meeting with Rob, the college pastor, to hang out, and he spent the entire meeting teaching me how to read the Bible, um, which was insanely helpful, even though I've been a Christian for years. Um, you know, when you think about it, someone had to teach us how to brush our teeth, how to ride a bike, how to drive a car, tie our shoes, and it makes sense that we have to be taught how to read our Bible, how to pray. Um, likewise, we need someone to teach us to confess our sins, to share the gospel, to remind us to cling to God's love and grace when life circumstances or our own sin tempts us to stray. And most importantly, we need someone to um, just continually preach the gospel to us. Um, because of people like Rob, Keith, Andy, and others who have discipled me, I've been blessed with the opportunity to begin to learn these things in my own life. Um, and I like to think of it kind of like discipleship through osmosis, as when you surround yourself by people who know and love the Lord, like you can't help but grow in your faith. And that's what I've had here at First College. So I'd just like to thank Rob, Megan, um, and all those involved as the Lord has used y'all's faithfulness to grow my faith. Thank you. I want to ask our graduates if you'll stand, and we're going to pray for you now. Heavenly Father, you know that we come to this moment with uh, a lot of emotions, and a lot of prayers prayed and tears shed, a lot of investment in these young people's lives, Lord. And uh, Father, as they look out on the life that's in front of them, we stand behind them with great hope, great hope that what you might do in them and through them. Father, I pray that you keep them close to you. I pray that you protect them, keep them from sin. Father, I pray that you help them to take hold of their faith, to live on mission for you, to set great examples. Father, I pray that you would use them for the sake of kingdom advance. Now bless them, bless their families, watch over them. Help us to be good church family to them during this season of their lives. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, choir and orchestra. Isn't that fantastic? And in two weeks, they're going to be presenting that song and many other songs in this great night of worship here at First Baptist at 6 o'clock, and so I hope you'll plan on being here. They're going to have a lot of friends with them, so it's going to be packed, and I hope you plan on being here and bring a friend with you for uh, Like a River Glorious. Uh, that's just coming up in two Sundays at 6 p.m. Well, I don't know about you, uh, but one of the most frustrating things that I deal with is car trouble and car maintenance. It doesn't matter when it happens, it's always inconvenient, right? So what do we do? We try to schedule the tune-ups, the regular maintenance to make sure that uh, we don't end up on the side of the road. And uh, take it in for a regular tune-up, ask the mechanic, you know, give it the once-over, the twice-over, make sure I don't have anything going on, let me know if I need to fix anything because I don't want to be on the side of the road. Well, I want you to imagine, what if you <clears throat> went to pick up your car after one of those routine uh, checkups for your car, and the technician comes out and says, you know what, your car is in great shape. I mean, you've got a mighty fine mechanic taking care of it. And so let me tell you, 10, 12,000 miles, it's, you know, I probably don't need to see you until sometime around then. So you have a great day, and you're thrilled, and you head out, and then later on that day, you're exiting the interstate, interstate and as you're trying to slow down going up that exit ramp, you realize your brakes are not working, and you're slamming the brakes, trying to get your best. You finally make it over the side of the road, get towed, and find out there was no brake fluid in the car. You could have died. And so you go to the mechanic and you say, did you not know that I needed brake fluid in the car? Well, what if the mechanic said to you, ah, yeah, I knew that, but uh, I didn't want to be the one to tell you, you know? It's afraid it might make you upset. And I just, I want this to be a place where you feel comfortable. You know, a place where you're just happy to be here. I, I didn't want to bring up that news, I, so, you know, sorry about that. But then you're like, whoa, you know, when I come to the mechanic, I don't want to live in a fantasy world. I need the truth about my car, right? Well, what if you went to the doctor's office? Nobody likes to do it, but you try to do that annual checkup, and you go in, run all the tests, and the doctor comes out and is looking over and says to you, you are a magnificent physical specimen. You are an Olympian, if I've ever seen one before. You're in great shape. I don't need to see you till next year. And you walked out feeling really good about yourself. Later on that day, you find yourself climbing up the steps. You feel tightness in your chest, and you collapse, wake up in the ER, and they say, your arteries are so clogged that you are about one Krispy Kreme away from the Grim Reaper. <laughs> Doctor shows up, and you say, didn't you know that I had something going on with my heart? Or what if he said, yeah, I knew, but I, I didn't want to be the one to tell you, you know? I'm afraid it would offend you. You might not come back, be bad for business. You know, this is a safe place where you feel loved and accepted. You'd be furious, wouldn't you? You'd be furious. You'd say, you know, when it comes to my body, I want the truth. You know, when something really matters in life, we don't want false comfort. We don't want to just simply avoid pain. We want and we need the truth. Well, imagine going to a church or a Bible study or maybe to spend some time with your Christian friends. And what you hear when you show up is, don't worry about that whole mismanaging your anger thing. Nobody here is going to confront you about that. We have our own problems. It's not that big a deal. People do a whole lot worse, you know? Or maybe they say to you, you know, I, we're not going to talk to you about how you like to hoard your money and only spend it on yourself, because when we get money, we think it's for us just to buy something new. So we're not going to talk to you about how you need to sacrificially give to help others, to advance the kingdom. You're not going to hear that from us, because you might get mad. You might leave. So you're fine here. Or maybe you're passive in the face of injustice. That's okay. We want people to be apathetic. Or, you know, if you're an obvious sin, we're not going to point that out to you. We're going to talk occasionally about sin, but we're going to talk about their sin, not your sin, not our sin, because that's kind of uncomfortable to talk about. So we're not going to address that with you. We want you to feel good here. Our goal is for you to walk out of this place feeling good about yourself. I have a feeling that, like me, what you need most in life is not just to feel good about yourself. You don't need to just fit in or to find a place where you're accepted or you're affirmed. What you need most is the truth. So the big question we all have to ask is, who out there will speak the truth to me? Because I have a sin problem, and sometimes I am unaware of how serious that sin problem is. 
And so I need brothers and sisters in Christ who care enough about me to speak the truth to me, even if it hurts a little, even if it makes me feel uneasy, because I recognize that my sin problem is leading me toward a life of destruction and absolute dissatisfaction. King David had a very serious sin problem, and we've been looking at his life and over the last several weeks, and we've seen some pretty incredible attributes and characteristics that are exemplified in his life. But if we're going to have an honest look at David's life, we're going to have to talk about his failures. 2 Samuel 11 tells the story of how in the spring, at the time that kings go off to war, David stayed home. The king stayed in Jerusalem. And what happened when David stayed home was not good. He had an affair with a married woman. She got pregnant, and David ended up having her husband killed. Well, almost a year passed between the time that David first saw Bathsheba, and so much time had passed that he probably thought, I think I'm safe. (laughs) Nobody is going to notice. I think the cover-up worked. But according to Psalm 32 that I hope you read this past week in our consumed plan, tells us David wasn't living in ease. During these moments, he writes, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. It was an emotionally difficult time for David, but guess what? He never came clean. He kept it all hidden. Is there anybody who would speak the truth to David? Well, the Bible tells us about a man named Nathan who was sent by God to David. Nathan was a prophet in the land and a trusted counselor uh, for the king. Now, I want to be honest with you this morning. I was not thrilled with the fact that our consumed Bible reading plan had me addressing King David's affair on Graduate Recognition Sunday. I thought, you know, maybe we skip over this chapter in David's life and deal with something that might be a little bit more, you know, exciting for y'all to hear about, maybe motivating as you head out. But then I thought about the critical element that brought David back to the Lord, and I realized this this message is so appropriate for all of us, but particularly for you graduates. What we're going to see this morning is the importance of true friends who are willing to call us out and who are willing, uh, that we're willing to listen to. So I can't think of a more appropriate message for you graduates as you head out into life. You spread your wings, you leave the nest, and as you do, you're going to leave behind a lot of people that have spoken the truth to you um, over the years, uh, that have uh, helped correct you so that you don't end up at the wrecked life uh, as you venture out away from your family or away from your church or the people that have known you since birth. So the question remains, who will it be in the next chapter of your life to speak the truth to you? Because you need to hear the truth. So this morning, we're going to take a look at this in a message entitled, We All Need a Nathan, from 2 Samuel 12. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12, and I'm going to read to you this morning verses 1 through 14. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, 
I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion, and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word today, even though it pierces our hearts. But Father, I pray that you would help us to remove the callous right now, to hear your truth as you speak to your children today. Father, help me not be a distraction, but mere conduit so you can meet with your people. Draw us all to the cross of Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the text, Nathan was sent by God to confront David for his sin. And in response to the word of God, David repents. Now, this day that we have today is framed with the idea of growing up, as we put attention on our graduates who have grown up to graduate. And, but what I hope that you'll see this morning as we look at the text is that if you want to grow up in Christ, then you need men and women of faith who will speak the truth to you. Now, one of the responsibilities of Israel's king was to adjudicate certain cases or whenever a trial would come before him in Israel. And so Nathan comes to the king as if he's bringing one of those problems, something by which the king is to make a judgment. Warren Wearsby, in his commentary, uses that premise to outline the passage of Scripture as the trial, the verdict, the sentence, and the pardon. So I'm going to use that same framework as we look at the passage together, beginning with the trial, verses 1 through 4. Verse 1 says, then the Lord said, sent Nathan to David. Now, Nathan obedient, uh, was obedient to the Lord's call. And this is not the first time that God had sent uh, Nathan to David. In 2 Samuel 7, verses 4 and 5, it says, The word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord. And on that occasion, Nathan comes before David, and he brings very good news. It didn't, uh, you know, he, it's words of blessing, of promise to make his name great like the rest of the great names on earth. It was this covenant that uh, his family and his name and his kingdom and his throne would endure. So Nathan came in that moment, chapter 7, to bring words of blessing from God. But in chapter 12, that's not the case. Nathan has a difficult assignment here. He comes to confront the king. Reminded of the words of Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Nobody wants to be inflicted with wounds. But why Solomon reminds us, wounds from friends can be an act of love. So the Lord sends Nathan to inflict wounds upon David. He comes as a friend, but he primarily comes as a prophet to come and speak the word of God to the king. So Nathan served the Lord, spoke on on his behalf. And I would say to you, it is so important to have friends who love the Lord first and foremost. I know it is very easy for us to find friends who will prioritize their relationship with us over their relationship with God. And so they care more about you than they care about honoring the Lord. And so what will they do? They will connive and collude with you to insulate you from the truth of God's Word so that you can remain in your sin, and probably so they can remain in their sin. So we just agree to just not go there. We need Christian brothers and sisters of conviction who prioritize their relationship with the Lord over their relationship with us. Otherwise, there's that temptation there. David did have servants who evidently colluded with him to bring Bathsheba, evidently didn't spread the news about it. Joab, the commander of the army, colluded with David to get Uriah to the front battle of the battle line so he would die there. Those are sins, and more than loyalty to us, we need people in our life who are loyal to the truth of God's Word. That's who Nathan was. So Nathan starts by telling the story to David as if it's a uh, crime that uh, David needs to bring judgment about. And his story says in a city there's a rich man and the poor man, and the rich man has more than he needs. He has all kinds of flocks and herds, and uh, he has more than he could ever want. Uh, but one day a um, traveler comes through, and hospitality is a big deal there. So he's got to provide a meal for this guy. But the guy who has everything is like, I don't want to give for my own flock, so what does he do? 
Well, nearby is this poor man. And the poor man did not have many flocks and many herds. The Scripture says he has one little ewe lamb that he raised as if it was his own child. He ate from the man's table, drank from his cup, and even would fall asleep there in his arms. Um, well, he evidently also had a loan with that rich man, and the rich man came and demanded of him, and he took away that one little ewe lamb, and he prepared it and served it to the traveler. Well, I'm sure when you hear that story, because I don't know what it is, but we can get more emotional thinking about animals than we can people. So I'm sure you're out there going, that is terrible. I can't believe he did that. You can feel the indignation that David feels as Nathan tells the story. Verse 5 says, David's anger burned greatly against the rich man. He says he deserves to die. He's done a terrible thing. He took advantage of this poor man, and he did something inhumane to save face with this traveler who showed up. How can somebody be so cruel? Now, according to the law, the man didn't deserve to die, but he did deserve to repay fourfold. And so that's what David says here in the text. Of all the blindness in the world, the worst kind of blindness is that which makes us blind to ourselves. David never considered that Nathan's story might be about him. Now, there's actually hints in the story. In verse 3, you'll notice how he points out that the ewe lamb would eat of the poor man's bread, drink of his cup, and lie in his bosom. Well, in chapter 11, where it describes how Bathsheba and David had this affair, well, David tries to cover up after Bathsheba's pregnant. So he brings Uriah home, but Uriah will not go to stay at home with his wife. And he says to him in verse 11, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. So there's a hint there that David never sees the connection. Why? Because he's blind to his own sin. Alexander White writes, Nathan's were, uh, sword, Nathan's sword was within an inch of David's conscience before David knew that he even had a sword. So Nathan begins the trial by describing the case in the form of a parable. David thought he's the judge, but God's the one who delivers the verdict. Verse 7, we consider the verdict, and it comes quickly. You are the man. Now, I wonder if Nathan paused when he delivered that. So direct, so harsh. Nathan was sent by God to be his mouthpiece to David. Well, as a preacher and pastor, I can tell you nobody really wants to be the mouthpiece of God because it's a challenging place to stand. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 7 says, Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel, so you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. And I'm going to stop right there. But God takes the assignment for the watchman very seriously. He, if he speaks and he sends you on assignment, there's no room for discussion. So God says to Nathan, you've got to go. So he goes to speak because God's truth is a matter of life and death. But we treat God's Word and our responsibility to one another so casually. Uh, we're more apt to connive and to collude and to cover up and, than we are to confront with truth. Well, collusion to cover up one another's sins, that's a very deep problem in the church. It's a very deep problem within Christian circles. Because we don't want to be vulnerable with one another. And since we don't want to be vulnerable with one another, we are unwilling to speak up to other people because we're afraid they might turn it on us. We're afraid of how it makes us feel when that happens. But we need Nathans who will speak the truth to us. I want to say to you graduates, surround yourself with people who speak the truth. It's very easy, it's very tempting to build a circle of people around you who will insulate you from spiritual conviction. Because they're there to accept you, to affirm you, and even to tolerate your sin. Don't build your friendship groups like that. And on the other hand, we need to be Nathans. We need to be Nathans to one another. 
Other people might not be as aware as you are right now of how we need each other, but we need to be not wishy-washy about the truth of God's Word. We need to stand firm on the truth of God's Word and have conversations that actually matter in eternity, conversations that point people to the Jesus, uh, uh, to Jesus, to the cross. So not conversations just simply about the Gamecocks or the Tigers or conversations about the weather and that flash flood that happened this morning or about Joe Biden and Donald Trump. We need conversations in the church that matter in eternity. And that's why I would say to those of you who are graduating and are leaving town, find a church. Find a local church. And don't just sit in the pew. Find a group, a group for small uh, group discipleship, because that's what you need in your life. After you are the man, Nathan declares, thus says the Lord God of Israel. Now he's speaking God's word as prophet, and the word of God is confrontational. Nathan begins his verdict here by reminding David all that God had done. He says, it's I who anointed you king over Israel. It's I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you all of these things. I would have given you more than that if you needed it. And I did all of this to save you, to deliver you, to put you in position of power. And then in verse 9, he drops the hammer here. He says, why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? When we choose to sin, we're despising God's word. We're saying um, um, our way or the world's way is better than God's way. We're saying we choose what is evil over what is good and right and true and best. We're saying what this book says and what it stands for doesn't matter. So I despise the Word of God in favor of sin. David despised the Word of the Lord. He seduced Bathsheba while her husband was away serving the nation in battle. He tried to cover it all up. Then he had Uriah struck down. He took Bathsheba as his wife. Nathan confronted David, but he does so with the Word of God. One of the best things that I think has come out of this consumed Bible reading plan that so many of you are participating with me in is to hear so many of you talking about personal application you've drawn as you've read the scriptures on your own. Many have experienced deep conviction just by reading God's Word. And it makes sense because God's Word is confrontational. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, for the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrows, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. When nothing able, I mean, nothing else is able to pierce our conscience, God's Word can. God's Word can. Maybe circumstances don't. Maybe your your disappointment in me won't. But God's Word can bring conviction. Nathan speaks God's Word to David, and it brings conviction. Now, the temptation... Whenever we read 2 Samuel 11, and um, it's to do the same thing that we do when we're thinking about sin in our everyday world. Happens the same thing when we come to chapter 12. We focus on the other person. Well, look at David. He is the man. What a terrible example he is. I can't believe he sunk so low. How in the world was he able to do that while he says he's after God's own heart? But I wonder if you hear the Spirit speaking to your heart as you read the Scripture The same words that Nathan spoke. You are the man. It's what I heard as I was studying for this message. Wes, you are the man. David missed the personal application of the story until Nathan kind of exposed him. We can be guilty of doing the same exact thing. He deserves to die. I can't believe he did that. We hear the word of God then in our hearts say, you are the man. And I know what you're thinking. What, me? I mean, David's terrible. This is an awful thing. Look at his sin. He went and had a full-blown affair in, in the most horrible way. And then he covers it up, and then he murders a man, and he acts like everything's fine. I've not done that, so I don't know that I am the man. Maybe you are, Wes. I don't know that I am. But I want you to remember how Jesus said to those masses gathered on the hillside just above the Sea of Galilee, he says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit a murder. But every one of you who is angry with his brother, who insults his brother, is guilty of murder. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But every one of you who looks on a woman with lustful intent is guilty 
of adultery. You are the man. So as we sit here this morning with guilty consciences, what recourse do we have? The same recourse David had. He expressed it in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Our recourse is confession and then repentance as we depend on God's mercy to lift us up. So the verdict from God is that David is the guilty sinner. And now Nathan delivers the sentence in verses 10 through 12. He says, now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. Verse 11, I'll raise up evil against you from in your own household. And I'm going to do this thing before all of Israel. It was done in the, under uh, shadow in the dark, but I'm going to put it out in the daylight. Everybody's going to see it. I mean, the consequences are very severe. They're very personal. But as you continue to read the Bible in 2 Samuel and then in 1 Kings and 2 Kings, you're going to see the drama of this declaration unfold. David's household is deeply troubled the rest of David's life and far beyond that. It's going to be fractured beyond repair. There's sexual violence among his children, treason by one of his own sons, betrayal, the heartbreak of the death of children. Whatever a man sows so shall he reap. So our sinful deeds produce real-life consequences in our lives. That's why I need somebody to speak the truth to me. That's why I need a Nathan, so that I don't get too far down the road, because I know I'm headed towards disappointment and destruction and dissatisfaction. Well, as many people have said before me, and so eloquently, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. That's what sin does. I cannot afford to insulate myself against the Word of God. Despising God's Word is not an option for me. Following the sentence, and then the guilty man speaks, and he finds pardon. Verse 13, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I've sinned. He comes clean. Can you imagine all the possible outcomes that Nathan imagined before he headed out on this venture? Oh, what if he does this? What if he does that? You think he dealt with a little bit of anxiety? What if this doesn't go like I hope it does? Nevertheless, he followed the Lord in obedience to his command. He trusted God for the outcome. And then he wounded his friend, wounded his king with the truth of God's word. And the result... Repentance. You know, only the word of God brings repentance. He could have told just a fancy story here or used manipulation or tried to do it in a public way, a creative way. But it's the word of God that brings repentance. David repents. He says, I've sinned against the Lord. And I want you to notice a whole other kind of scandal takes place. You probably missed it. It's at the end of verse 13. So I've sinned against the Lord. And then Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. This is the scandal of grace, the scandal of the gospel. David deserved to die. I mean, what did the law say? Bring the adulterer out and the adulteress. Put the stones in their hands, let them kill him. He deserves to die. So David confesses, and he has a death sentence on his head, but grace steps in. What you don't deserve and you could never earn, David, is yours. You shall not die. Well, because of Christ's finished work on the cross, God is able to save lost sinners, and he's able to forgive straying saints. The remedy for sin, 100% of the time, is repentance. It's not affirmation. It's not acceptance. It's confession with repentance. I've sinned against the Lord, and then I turn away from sin, and I turn towards God. That's the remedy. And it's a difficult thing to confess. It's a difficult thing to repent because it means I have to own up to it. I can no longer hide it. I've got to admit it. And I've got to say I'm as filthy, I'm more filthy probably than you think I am. It means I have to say I'm wrong, and that's hard. And it would be so much harder if we didn't have the grace and mercy of God to lean on. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. We don't come to God saying, well, this is how I'm going to make it right, God. 
We throw ourselves wholly on the mercy of God, and we ask God, you fix it, God. You clean it up. You right the wrong. I can't do it. Now, someone did die for David's sins. It was the Son of Man. Jesus, our Lord, took the blows that David deserved for his sin. He took it at Calvary, and now David can receive forgiveness. Now, that doesn't mean all the consequences goes away, right? Nathan makes it clear, your sin's going to wreak havoc in your family. Your son is going to die. But you get full pardon for the eternal punishment that you deserve. How does he get it? By faith. The only way we're saved from the punishment we deserve for our sin is by faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Have you believed Jesus for salvation today? Or are you still trying to act like there's nothing wrong with you and you're perfect? Or are you trying to hide it? Are you too afraid to open your hands and say, it's me, I have sinned? Will you believe him today? We can only imagine what would have happened if David would not have a Nathan. You might foolishly think, you know, he might have got away with it. Probably wouldn't experience the consequences. Probably would have been a better story. But I am certain that David's repentance is the only reason we remember him as the man after God's own heart. He would have gone the way of Saul, but he repented. Why? Because God used Nathan in his life. Faithful are the friend, uh, wounds of a friend. It's interesting as you read in the scriptures, David had a son and he named him Nathan. It just goes to show that the faithful wounds of friends can pay off in the end. Graduates, our prayer for you is as you venture out into the life in front of you, live within the context of Christian community. Push yourselves, be pushed towards the gospel, towards the cross, and towards righteous living. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you save us when we deserve death. We thank you that we can have hope because of your mercy. Now, Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts as we all respond to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We come to a time of response. Our choir is going to sing. Maybe the Lord's speaking to your heart. I'm going to invite you to stand as the choir sings. I'll be waiting down front if you need to speak with me. Well, as the Lord is speaking to you today, let me encourage you to go to your phone and call the number on your screen. And we have some wonderful people who would love to pray and talk with you right now. So simply go to your phone and call the number on your screen. And once again, we thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Perhaps the Lord is speaking to your heart and you've got a decision to make and uh, don't miss the opportunity. At the conclusion of our service, we'll have staff, staff and volunteers at the Connection Desk and you can stop by there to talk to them and they'll help you as you make a decision for trusting Christ. Let me say one thing before we introduce our graduates. We have, um, uh, our ushers have cards on the way out and it's an invitation card uh, to the uh, Like a River Glorious that's coming up in, uh, in two weeks. Um, the 19th at 6 p.m. here at First Baptist Church and this uh, choir loft, and I think it's going to even wrap because there's a lot of choirs that are going to join us for that. Uh, we want you to be here, to be able to enjoy it and to hear it, but also because we need you to serve as great hosts for the f people that will be joining us that day. So you mark it down your calendars, take one of those cards, and you invite somebody with you. All right, I think that I now have Lee Clamp, which I have to say, this Lee Clamp, our interim student minister, Lee Clamp, just defended his thesis and is now Dr. Lee Clamp, is that right? Congratulations to you. <laughs> and I didn't even have to use any weapons in the defense. 
Congratulations, class of 2024, and the parents of the class of 2024. You did it. It has been an honor uh, this year to, um, to get to know many of your graduates and our students here and our student ministry. And so as we honor our high school graduates today, they come from many schools from around the uh, Columbia area. And, uh, and so you're going to have the, the opportunity to hear about their future and their future plans. And so join me as we welcome them to the platform. Also, if you will, refrain from, from clapping in between each one. Just hold your applause to the very end, and then we can give them a big round of applause as they finish. My name is Ruby Austin, and I'm graduating from Ben Lippin School, and I plan to attend Clemson University in the fall to study nutrition. My name is Scarlett Babcock. I will be graduating from Chapin High School, and I plan on attending to Minnesota State University to continue my running career and major in dental hygiene. My name is Jordan Bauman. I am graduating from Cardinal Newman School. I plan to attend the University of South Carolina, where I will major in economics. Good morning, my name is Mackenzie Kerner. I'm graduating from Ben Lippin School. In the fall, I plan to attend Anderson University to major in nursing. Good morning, my name is Luke McCrudden. I'll be graduating from Ben Lippin School. I'll be attending Clemson in the fall to major in engineering. My name is Mary Grace Mitchell. I'll be graduating from River Bluff High School. I plan to attend Clemson University and study psychology. My name is Jacob Muir. I'll be graduating from Dreer High School and will be attending the College of Charleston to major in engineering. My name is Natalie Walk. I'm graduating from Northside Christian Academy and I plan on attending Wofford in the fall to major in chemistry and minor in ASL. My name is Daniel Violette. I'm graduating from Lexington High School. I plan to go to U the University of South Carolina to study information technology. Afterwards, I, plan I hope to commission into the United States Air Force as a second lieutenant. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce the college graduates and the graduate school graduates uh, of 2024. Hello, I'm Brandon Cassidy. I'm graduating from the University of South Carolina with a BFA in studio art with a concentration in graphic design. Good morning, church. My name is Hunter Corzine, and I recently graduated from the University of South Carolina with my MBA in finance, um, and I've had the honor of participating in the Young Professionals Group. Good morning, everybody. My name is Benjamin Diaz, and I recently graduated from the University of South Carolina with a BA in art studio and a minor in media arts. I plan to get a job in around Columbia um, in um, just like in the creative field, uh, maybe at a local church or at a local company. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Joel Keith. I graduated from the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Columbia and I will be heading to New Hanover Regional Medical Center in Wilmington, North Carolina as a general surgery resident. Thank you. Morning, everybody. My name is Jack Luxmore. I'm graduating from the University of South Carolina with a Bachelor of Science in Sport and Entertainment Management. In June, I moved to Oxford, Mississippi to uh, begin serving as the Director of Communications for Ole Miss Athletics.
My name is Drew McKay. Um, I just graduated with a degree in accounting, and unfortunately, I'll be going back to school for Masters of Accounting, but I'm getting married to Megan Pender. I love you. Hey, my name is Clayton Stacy. I graduated from University of South Carolina with a major in cardiovascular technology. My plan is to work over at MUSC Columbia in their cardiac cath lab, so treating and preventing heart attacks. Hopefully I don't see any of y'all there. Um, just stay away from the Krispy Kreme. Um, my plan, Lord willing, after that is to apply to med school, and I just got engaged to Kylie Walker, so I guess I'm getting married soon too. Good morning, my name is Madeline Weston and I'm graduating with the Bachelors of Arts in Journalism from the University of South Carolina. This summer I'll be attending New York University Summer Publishing Institute then pursuing a master's degree in publishing and writing at Emerson College. Aren't you proud of these graduates and all these many things that you're hearing about them? I want to ask you to do something. I want you to pray for them. Uh, we, we bring them up here, we put them in front of you. You know some of them, some of them you may not know, but you can just take their names with you or just the person the Lord knows and you pray for them. You pray that God will use them in amazing ways, protect them, care for them, and watch over them. But we have a high school graduate who's going to come and pray our benediction. So let me invite you to stand after he um, prays. Uh, then we will sing, and on your way out, you pick up one of those cards. Come on, Jacob. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for our First Baptist Church graduates. May the strength of God sustain us. May the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. And may the love of God go with us this day and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for worship today. For more information and to join us in reading through the Bible this year, please visit consumed.life. We look forward to seeing you next week.